Hey everybody, how you doing? It's Trent Austin from Austin Custom Brass, and I ran a little poll on my YouTube channel yesterday asking what people wanted this 60th mini lesson to talk about. So we're going to talk a little bit about endurance and some of my thoughts on it. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, thanks again for being such great supporters of the shop, especially during these COVID times. I actually decided I'd do a video in a different room today for the mini lesson series, and I can't believe it's the 60th technical mini lesson, although we have more than 60 videos on that playlist. So please take a moment to hit the subscribe button, and I won't do any more crazy disco moves to keep up to date with us. Thank you again for your support. We are open. The shop is open for appointments only. If you go to austincustombrass.biz, it's right at the top of our page. You could sign up for an appointment time. Of course, reach, reach out to us anytime if you have questions. First and foremost, this is the 60th lesson, so I wanted to bring in Mike to say, and then Elvis thought he'd drop in as well. And then, of course, one of my favorites. But you guys are the reason the shop exists. You're the reason this channel exists. And I'm very happy to talk a little bit about some of the things that I do to work on my endurance. It's quite a challenge, especially now because there's gig chops and then there's practical endurance chops. Um, the clip you just heard at the beginning, that was me just goofing off. That's on my MV3C with a deep V cup. So I've actually felt that I've been able to increase my endurance during the pandemic, partially due to the fact that I'm not required to practice as much stuff specifically for jobs that I was doing. But here's a few big, big, big things. The first thing you're going to want to do, and I'm going to switch this camera over so you can see, you would really want to be able to make sure that you're not overblowing. There's another mini lesson that I have on this topic about proper usage of air, your Airstream. And often what I see my students doing is that they're pushing so much energy into the instrument that the instrument's actually fighting them. We don't want that to happen. We don't want to have the instrument overpower us. Let me show you, um, well, I'll play a little example. I'm going to turn off this mic and turn on another mic. Example is me just playing at a comfortable airstream, almost like I consider a conversational airstream. Pardon the clams. The clams are not included in this mini lesson. But this is me overpowering the instrument and pushing too much air in. hear the sound sag a little bit, which doesn't make much sense. But for me, it's a physical reaction. This often happened to me on gigs. I'd be in the practice room, everything would be going swimmingly well. And then I'd get on the gig and I'd be super excited and I'd over push the trumpet. Here's a huge reason why. You're not in your practice space. I'm going to show you my acoustics. Well, the trumpets don't really add to the acoustic here, but I'm going to show you if I zoom around here. See all those tiles? Those tiles help 
the sound stay focused and true. So hold on, I'm gonna zoom you back here. So having an, a properly acoustically treated room helps a ton. Now, you, you might say, hey dude, I don't have the money, I don't have the room, I can't really do that. This is one of the biggest endurance hacks you could ever do for yourself. And trust me, you wanna, you wanna check this out. Play with earplugs. When you're in a live performing situation, play with earplugs. It's not actually a bad idea to, to play with earplugs anyways, because you're going to be able to focus on the center of your sound when you have the earplugs in. Then when you get into a loud acoustic environment or something where you can't hear yourself and you're always overblowing, you'll be able to properly adjust to that. So we you, uh, we sell, um, I'm not sure they're in this room, they might probably in another one of our sales rooms, but this is, these are the earpiece ones and uh, earphone, I think they're earpiece, but um, uh, my assistant will correct that on the uh, description, but they are fantastic for me to hear. Now, if you don't have earplugs, I cannot recommend playing with a mute that gives you great feedback response. This mute, the solo mute, great mute. This is an old, old one. Let me just put it on here. This allows me to play with my normal dynamic, but I'm getting tremendous feedback from behind the horn. What that allows me to do is to really feel the balance between my airstream, the resistance in the horn, the resistance inside the mouthpiece, and where I want to personally move that. Resistance is huge, and I think a lot of people think resistance is a bad thing. That's why you see a recent trend in the past, well, it's not even recent anymore, people have switched back in the past maybe five, well, 15, 20 years to these really open setups in their mouthpieces and really open setups in their horns. Well, tight bell here. That's an old super recording. The mouthpiece itself is fairly deep, but the throat and backbone are not. Um, so that proper, you know, balance between the air, the proper balance between the way it feels inside the instrument are huge. Now, there are a couple videos that we have on this these topics about how to adjust to a mouthpiece, how to feel if you're overblowing or underblowing. Um, so that's a huge thing. The earplugs, humongously beneficial. And I will admit that it kind of stinks to play with earplugs because you lose the, the beautiful shimmer and ring around the sound in your head. You're getting almost like what the vibration sensation is inside your head. Um, but you, you will quickly learn how to, to, to adjust to that. Here's another pro tip. If you're recording, um, if you're playing with earplugs, record yourself. So then you play and you listen, you can then analyze the true trumpet sound. Again, this is, it's worth its weight in gold and then some. Plus you'll save your ears because so many musicians, especially the musicians that are one generation older than I am, that have played in big bands or rock bands have terrible problems with their hearing, uh, tinnitus and the like. I actually have some tinnitus in my left ear. Um, so it's it, that's not fun at all. The other thing about endurance, and this is kind of, well, geez, this is great. You're giving me this tip, fantastic, but there is a use it or lose it mentality here. Now, one thing I do in my practicing when I'm playing, especially when I'm improvising, but this is a huge thing that I, I see from practice room endurance to gig endurance is that I, I lack the gig endurance to play longer solos. And I'm always playing with great sax players and they're playing, you know, eight to 10 to 12 to 14 choruses uh, at jam sessions. I don't know if that's good or bad. What they play is great. So yeah, maybe it is good, but I can't do that. I'm a trumpet player. I can't do it. I want to build up that long-term endurance. Well, Part of what you have to do is 
do the use it or lose it mentality where you play and you play and you play and you play. And then you really have to be dialed into how it feels exactly after you play. When I was studying with Hal Crook, the great uh, trombone professor from Berklee School of Music, who's actually still teaching, you can go to his website, uh, halcrook.com or halcrook.net, and sign up for online lessons. He's literally one of the finest teachers you'll ever get to work with. He would, he was a huge proponent as of if you played something, then you'd listen to it right after. So you, that builds two things. That gives you a chance to to rest the embouchure to help rebuild the endurance, but also it allows you to really analyze when during the course of a solo or during the course of a piece, when are you failing? When I was working on Brandenburg's, I knew I was ready to play the Brandenburg Concerto when I could play the first movement, then no break during the second movement. Second movement, there's no trumpet. It's to allow the trumpet player to have a break. I would play first movement, third movement, and I would do that three times in a row and then take a break, literally. So I'd play first movement, take 30 seconds. Third movement, take 30 seconds. First movement, third movement. And, and by doing that, one, it, I couldn't do it. I, couldn't, I could not physically do it. It was just decimating on my body. But eventually I could go through two times. And eventually, three, one, once I got through three, team, three times, I knew I was okay. And in fact, I've done two Frandenbergs in one day. It was no problem. Um, my old teacher, Ed Carroll, did 31 in 28 days or something. Yeah, he gets the record. But um, still, it is use it or lose it. A couple things that can help you with that is notice the beautifully crafted simplicity of the Arben's book in the beginning sections. When you start, say, I practice pages 20 through 33 most days, but they start out as three-line exercises, with the exception of 20, uh, page 20 when it does the 12 key thing. If you turn to page 22, three lines, four lines, three lines, four lines. You do some of those syncopations, three, four. When you do some of the eighth and sixteenth rhythms on page 28, I think, they start getting a little bit longer. By the end of page 33, you have half page etudes. This is the great way to build your endurance. So when you're playing a piece like Goldman 1, I, I think you all know Goldman 1, but I'll play a little bit for you. one thing you can easily do in your practice sections is to take the section in C and that's your first stop. Rest for a, a, a time. The time period can be 20 seconds. The time period can be one minute. This is something you have to write down in your practice journals and I hope all of you are using practice journals. Then you shrink that time. It's very similar. I've recently got back into cycling. I'm so happy, which also helps my endurance, by the way, tremendously for this guy who's super out of shape, but less out of shape than I was a month ago. Um, you're working on just, can I get a half mile longer? Can I increase my wattage by 10 watts per, per thing? This is what you do when you're practicing. So you have this section, then you have the B section, then you have the last A section. You put predetermined amounts of rest in, 30 seconds. Then three days from now, 25 seconds. Two days from then, 20 seconds. And you analyze. You still have to do this. Ed Carroll said it was as simple as you make a plan, you execute the plan, you analyze the plan, you make the plan. But it can be quite simple. But you, you're, you're, doing, you're building endurance by shrinking the amount of time in rests. And then eventually, you have no problem. Um, Things like Walter Smith's Top Tones, all those books. I think it's Walter Smith, so I'm not thinking the sax player Walter Smith. But, uh, you know, you're working on all of these things to increase endurance by the page. And if you can't get through it, it's cool. 
Don't expect to get through it, but expect to mark where you stop on the page with a date or make a note in your cell phone. Put a note in your practice journal. I got to the third line and then I started to get it. My tongue started getting really tired. Okay, now you have a goal. Get to the next point. And constantly while you're doing it, try to be more relaxed. If it looks right, it's right. If it sounds right, it's right. If it feels right, it's right. Those three things can help propel you through increasing endurance very, very easily. So there you go. That's some thoughts on endurance. I'm sure I'll add to this and maybe we'll have a, a live session follow-up on YouTube to talk about this. I hope you enjoyed this mini lesson. Please hit the subscribe button wherever it might be to stay up to date with us. Thank you again for your continued support. Keep on tooting, okay? Cheers.